The information provided in this show is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. Viewers should use their own discretion and consult with a healthcare professional for personalized guidance and recommendations. Welcome everybody. Happy Halloween. We are so glad that you joined us. You are watching The Health Revolution. I'm your host, Adriana Morrison, and we are excited about engaging conversation, elevating health and wellness, and empowering transformation. We hope that you are doing well today, and we are certainly excited about today's episode. You know, health and wellness is not just the physical piece behind this. It is also the piece that encompasses the mind, body, and spiritual connection and all the things that fall under the umbrella piece. And so with that, we're going to dive into something that's unique that allows us to explore that artistic side of ourselves that maybe we didn't realize that we had. And so I've got to tell you about our next guest. My guest today, her name is Jean Bissett, and she is known as a conscious artist and healer. So Jean, she transcends the role of an artist and she's a transformative force and a visionary with an unshakable mission to truly transform the world. And she does that, of course, through art. She alchemizes the rawness of the human experience, embracing emotions and authenticity and channeling them into cycles of growth. She's got an incredible background. We're talking navigating through the gallery world, gracing worldwide galleries. She has had extinct, distinguished collectors such as Richard Besser, which is Good Morning America, QVCs, Bob Warden, uh, Dre Weber, Pink and Cher, just to name a few. She's truly a force to be reckoned with. And this is where we can delve into art just a little bit more. Without further ado, please welcome my next guest, Jean Bassett. Jean, welcome. How are you? <laughs> it's so awesome to be here. Thank you for the spooky, spooky the, the, there was a spooky opening at the uh, beginning, which is fun. Of course, it it it, uh, it it definitely flows with the spirit of the season. So so okay. I'll tell you, I love the fact that you that you have made you became a force in the art world. Tell us a little bit about your backstory and what are some things that that are part of your journey in in literally changing how we connect with ourselves and with others. Oh my gosh, where do where do we start? Right, that is that's a, that's a lot. That's a massive opening. Thanks for the non-direct <laughs> question. Tell me everything. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, one of the things I I talk about when people ask me about this actually is when we embark on what I would consider my dharmic path. When we travel down a road that is we're designed for it, um, we think it's going to be easier. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's not the case, right? It, my my background per se, I mean, I was born for this. I I I couldn't walk away from it and I tried many times. I do have a a healing background, a shamanic background. I've done a lot of other studies besides art in this lifetime and I'll say it that way. And quite frankly, the art kept m magnetizing me back. And no matter how much I tried to walk away from it, and, and I'll share the reason I was walking away from it many, many times, was because I was taught that there was no way I could be successful doing this. 
And so that's ingrained, right? Something that we begin to believe about ourselves when other people continuously tell us, gosh, that's going to be so hard. What are you thinking? What are you crazy? And, you know, you're a smart woman. Maybe you should, you know, be a doctor, lawyer, plumber, whatever, <laughs> whatever, anything but artist. Um, and so I, I did walk away from it on and off. And what I do have to say is when you, when, when you're born to do something, you just can't say no. It, you know, everything else pales in comparison. And so in 2012, well into my forties, um, am I aging myself? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I was actually in my late forties in 2061. So I decided, I literally decided. And it, it's so weird when it happens, like it drops in. And then you think the first thing you're going to feel is excitement. Nope. First thing you feel is fear, mm -hmm. right? Because this is the thing. It becomes the big thing. So that's a that's a that's an overview of my background. Obviously, details are are tricky. I know maybe there's a book for that. You know, I love the fact that you that you <laughs> talked about in the very beginning that you, you know, that that people felt differently that that they had a hard time seeing that you could that you could make a life, you could make a living in in art. Where do you suppose some of that? Where does that get traced back to? for you, for your specific journey? Was it family? Was it school? Was it people who just knew about what you wanted to do and they just added their opinion? What was that like? Everybody has an opinion, right? Even now. Yeah. Um, I would say family of origin through no fault of their own, right? They had their own fears and they had their own, you know, um, a parent wants to protect you, wants you to be successful. And if that level of success is something they don't understand, they, they don't want you to do that. Mm -hmm. They want you to go, you know, let, let's go do the thing that I know you're going to be safe, you know? And I mean, I guess I'll call it the old days In the old days, women go get married, even, even would go to university to find men. You know, there are movies that have been made about this. Yep. So for me to step up, you know, a, as a woman, um, and say, I want to do this thing that quote unquote for many, many years was, you know, like a man's world. And to some degree still, everybody went, oh no, oh no, don't do that. <laughs> what I will share though, is the people in school saw the talent. Now they're not attached to my success or my failure. They're not there to protect me. They're there to encourage me. So when I took art classes in school, I would have teachers come to me and they'd be like, you know, you're the real deal. And I'd be like, I I don't know what that means. What do you mean? What do you, what do you mean? You know? Um, and so it took me a long time. It took me a really long time. And in, in, I, I guess it was really 2006 that I really started to look at it more closely, but it wasn't till 2010, 2012, where I proclaimed it. And I think that is something that people need to know about. It can take you a long time to wobble back and forth, but once you claim something and you stake your, your flag, it's kind of done. And it, again, it doesn't mean it's going to be a smooth road. That's the whole point. Um, if, if you're choosing like yourself, you're choosing something with very, those of us who are, I call us alpha females, right? We're, just, we're very, you know, right. We're strong and we move forward. And these are the thing, you know, we put one step in front of the other. If we fall down, we get back up. I'm fine. Don't worry about the blood. You know, that's who, it's kind of who we are. And we think, at least I did, that that's how I'm going to get there. And you can only get so far doing that. After a while, you actually have to realize that there's a higher level of you that's sort of protecting you as well, but wanting, protecting you in the other way, want you to be successful, want you to have everything you want. I'm going to lead you to that place. And so it leads to a co-creation. So what made you, what made you the real deal in the eyes of teachers and, and what, what defines the real deal? Oh gosh. I'm going to give you two definitions. They thought it was the real deal because I was a natural, um, gosh, I remember a specific event where we were to do an abstract painting of a still life and it was supposed to be monochromatic. So it was supposed to be all the same tones and, and very little color variation 
And I did the piece and the teacher came over and he, that was one of the lean ins. You're the real deal. And, and I was just like, okay, so I'm not really sure what that means because I was born with that talent. I now know that we spend lifetimes doing things. So it's the mastery came from all of those other experiences. And when I came into this lifetime, I was supposed to do this thing. And so when someone comes in and says, you're the real deal, I, I actually think everybody's a reflection of you or your, or your higher self or your, I am. So they come in and they remind you, get out. We got you. This is going to happen. If you just let it come, keep going, just keep going. Nowadays, I call the, you know, when I say I'm the real deal, what I mean is, is I stay in it. Mm. I'm going to keep going. If it's time to rest, I try to <laughs> alpha female. <laughs> I try to rest, right? If it's time to collaborate, I collaborate. Uh, if it's time to work really hard, I put my sneakers on, I lace them up and I go. If it's time to exercise because my body gets too tired, it's time to move so that I can create levels of health in my body so that I can keep going. So what are the, what are the elements of art that really spoke to you that really connected? Cause I, I know that art for so many people is subjective. Um, and sometimes you know, we, we don't, we don't put the emphasis on it the way that we need to. The arts just allow that interconnection. So what are, what were some things, what were the elements of art that really spoke to you that, that just gave you those signs to go for it and stay on this journey? That's a great question. And it has a lot of levels of answers. Um, one thing I'm very driven by is color and color, color has each color has a vibration. Right. So we can, you know, sort of the metaphor for the rainbow and prisms and and how we see color. Um, so that would be one. The other would be mark making and symbolism that just sort of drops in. But on a different level, the thing that drives me the most is the fact that and I didn't know I knew how to do this. The fact that people would reach out to me and tell me about the emotional responses they had to the work. So, and I'm, I'm a very emotionally charged person. Like I use emotion for, as one of my tools. I'm not afraid to cry. I'm not afraid to laugh out loud. I'm not afraid to snort. You might even get one out of me today. Did, you know, so I, I like being that genuine human. And so when I translate that onto the canvas and somebody responds emotionally, that's the juice. Mm. That's really the, which is weird because it almost feels like it has nothing to do with the art, right? It's like how you connect with another. And because art is a channel, it's a, it's a channeled aspect of who we are. Right. <sighs> what is it? What, what don't we get in society about art? Oh, I think, I think we get it all. I think we're afraid of it. <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's really that we don't get it. I think it's that we put away the sovereign autonomous connection to the truth of who we are and art mm -hmm. opens that up. And so it can be a little frightening to some who have like boxed themselves in and put themselves in like, this is what I'm going to do. And we're not going to be utilitarian and I'm going to do the 3d world. And I'm going to make sure that I push my way through everything. Art reminds you that you're not those things. And so that can be a little jarring. For me, it's it's about the messaging that matters in, in that we can safely and beautifully and vulnerably open ourselves up to a different way of being. And art invites us to do that. It really is the bridge to that. What was what were some of the pivotal points in your life, in your journey, both professionally and personally, that told you you made it in the art world, where you you hit a greater level where you started to impact others on an even greater exponential scale? This is going to sound like a weird answer because I no longer live exactly in the world where I thought I made it. Um, I had probably at, at one point I had like 26 galleries nationwide, like representing mm -hmm. my work, um, which made me a machine. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I'm, I'm fairly prolific anyway, but um, I was really working hard. 
but I was making a multiple six figure income. And I thought, Oh my gosh, this is it. This is, I've arrived. This is, this is holy. Wow. And I became increasingly disillusioned by many, many things, not only um, the disconnect from clients, for example, because when you work through a gallery, they're your gatekeeper mm -hmm. and justifiably so, but I'm a natural marketer. So that part of it was really hard for me. Um, my defining moment as an artist is going to be an answer that you, you're not going to expect. And it's when I took all my work off the market about five years ago, because what? I was, huh? Go ahead. Why, why is that? What yeah, right. <laughs> Um, because I felt like I was in my shadow career mm -hmm. and I had to recalibrate who I was as an artist. And I would never have gotten from where I was to where I am now, had I not done that because I was too busy feeding the machine. I could create a painting. I don't mean to brag, but I could create a painting and, and make $8,000 within like a month. It was just like, boom, boom, boom. And I started to look at my life and I was like, okay, you're doing the thing you always wanted to do, but you're not really doing it the way you want to do it. And what is wrong? And so when we become increasingly unhappy, especially doing the thing we adore, we got to figure that out. We got to take it to that next level. And that was what I was able to do when I took my, when I took my work out of the gallery, the scariest thing I ever did. Scariest thing. I, well, that and divorce. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can imagine. I, I, I can't imagine the latter. I've been there, but I can't, I can't imagine, you know, and, and it, it just, be, it begs me to ask what were some, were there boundaries even within the art world that you stumbled upon that surprised you? Were there, yes. were there things that were, so there were. Oh, for sure. Um, the, the, some of the boundaries are things I'm going to say that I, I, I'm going to feel bad upfront before I even say them. Cause some people are going to be like, what gallery owners who really wanted to be successful artists and couldn't make it. And so they open galleries, which is great, but they're not necessarily business people. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing that became sort of a hiccup and not all galleries. Of course I had wonderful galleries who knew exactly what they were doing and they were doing it well. Um, the other boundary for me though, is I'm, I'm motivated by connection with people. So working through the galleries actually became a problem that would serve other artists really well, because all they want to do is be in their studio making art. I love people. I'm an extrovert. So for me to be in my studio all day and not doing like things like this with you, I, I would shrivel. I would die. Even though art drives me forward, it's not the only thing. And it doesn't, we're multifaceted humans. We're not just one thing. You're not just a trainer. You're a wife. You're, you know, what, all the other things, right? You're entrepreneur, business owner, wild ass woman, all the things. We have to have that level of balance in our lives. And for me, it's all about connection. And so I was missing that. There was a, a glass ceiling, I guess, right? I was never going to, I just felt like I couldn't get to that next level. Um, and the other thing is, is galleries are retail stores. So they want you to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, even though they say they want you to keep growing. You keep growing, but don't go too far. You, you'll scare people. You'll scare my customers. So then there's that, so then they're, there, therein lies the old, um, that, that pressing upon us of careful, just color within the lines, color within the lines. lines. Yeah, for real. And I think you asked me, uh, we've had a couple of uh, conversations before this. You asked me one time, like, um, and I'm sorry if I'm skipping ahead, not waiting for you, but if, yeah. if a mother wants their child to be an artist, the first thing I said to you was don't send them to an art class. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all my all my artists who are teachers of children are going to be like, what? <laughs> um, I'm not talking about my friends or the people who do really great work. But a lot of times teachers, once again, will inflict their own concerns and their own entrapments and their own fears onto a child. So like, let's say a child wants to color the, the sky purple, which I would highly encourage. In fact, I would encourage a green sky sometimes that doesn't really come into play or let me show you how to do this better. Children are wild and that's where we start. 
right? And that's what art is. It's a, it's a wild, skinny branch reaching beyond the signpost sort of way of living. I got to share one story with you that art is the reason why I graduated early from high school. So I was in, yes, I, you didn't know that you don't know this story, but I'm about to share you with it you and the viewers. Not. When I was, when I was in kindergarten and we were in the first week one of class, uh, the teachers were, you know, were asking us to draw horses and I wanted to color, I, I wanted to color them of, of different colors. And, and so I was getting rep, reprimanded for coloring my horses red and blue. And so I got sent to the principal's office after really protesting for what <laughs> I, what I hear the story to be 10, 15 minutes. And my mother got called into the principal's office and she pretty much defended me and said, she's, she's very creative. She can do whatever she wants in, in, in terms of art. And so then they tested me the following week. And then I apparently, however I tested was enough to advance to the first grade. So, so I know <laughs> art has had, art is extremely impactful and there's so much more that we're, we're going to dive into, but first we're going to take a commercial break. We will be right back after this. We're back here on the health revolution. My guest today is Jean Bassett, renowned conscious artist and healer. And we were talking about how art transcends in life and talking about the, the ways in which we can impact. We, you started to dive into how we're impacting kids' lives and what is uh, the, the better, the more effective way to, to teach art. And, and share with us some of your points on how children can benefit from navigating through their schooling and en encompassing art. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Another can of worms. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, the first thing that happens when a society wants to keep when the, the powers that be want to keep a society like in, in, in captivity is take away any kind of creativity. And so when music and art and dance and, and gym came out of the schools, um, that was my first, uh Oh, you know, um, I'll tell you a funny story if you don't mind as, as my response, I was, um, I was teaching a pottery class to some kids at an art center. And I didn't even know that I could do pottery. I, I, I sat down at a wheel one day and I just started throwing clay and the, the teacher came over and said, you're not supposed to know how to do that yet. <laughs> and I said, All right. Well, sorry. Sorry. Just, just to be the, the anomaly in your world. But I decided I wanted to, to work with kids. And because I'm such a control freak, um, I really, I did that thing. I just told you teachers will do. 
I wanted the, this child to really get it. Right. And so I put my hands on the child's hands and I showed the child and I, the child made a, a little girl, she made this little pot and it, you know, all happy, all the things, but I helped her do it. Right. So in her evaluation, which was a wonderful evaluation, except she wrote, except X, X, S, E, P, T. I wish she would let me make my own. Mm, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she just wanted to play in the mud. She just wanted to make a mess. She wanted it to be wonky and curvy and whatever it was. She wanted it to be her own. That's incredible. Greatest yeah. lesson. Greatest lesson. Yeah. Right? So as so as women, of course, as we're getting older, talk a little bit about how what you've noticed, women who are who are diving into art or maybe are curious about art, what are some ways that we can better connect using these elements and just tapping into our essence that in ways we've not done so before? I'm a strong advocate of meditation. And I think art can be meditative, um, you know, much like running. I used to be a huge runner. Um, don't run so much anymore. My, I'm kind of messed up my knees, but whatever. But but it, there is. I still I still walk all the time. There's a form of meditation that occurs when we are moving through that. One of the number one things that I try to tell people, especially if I have either a course or a class where people are not necessarily artists and they're kind of want to be artists is um, I encourage them to make a mess, for one. Mm. I encourage them to somehow put down their expectations of what they're going to create. Because again, I'm not here to show them how to do something in the same way another artist would. What I want them to do is open up their own channel to their own knowingness and creativity, which we can then apply to life lessons as well. And if I get somebody who's particularly um, not untrainable, as I call it, untraining you, I blindfold them. Mm. Can't see what you're doing. <laughs> Gotta let go. <laughs> now that's a way to let go. That's as clearly that's that's really trusting the process. <laughs> well, yeah, they don't like it very much. <laughs> I do that. I do that with um, with seasoned artists as well. To, to teach them how to feel their way, to how to smell the color, um, how to how to vibrationally move into it. They're always surprised when they open, especially trained artists, they're, they're surprised when they open their eyes. It, it, usually it's something pretty magnificent um, because our brain will take over and try to tighten things up so they're a little more recognizable. Um, not that that's not a gorgeous way to create art. I, I love um, hyper-realism, as a matter of fact. Um, but there's a meditative process that I always try to bring people through so that they can connect. It creates this sort of column or a cord of grace that allows you to step into this space and create things you would never otherwise create. So... What are some essence that... What are the essences that women bring to the world of art? Emotion, for one. Mm. A willingness. Um, I find more women, as long as we're not programmed into being a little more, you know, you know, manly or right, we bring out our masculine, which my masculine is alive and well. So I'm always looking to how do I open up the channels to my femininity, which I can never say. Um, but I think women are naturally that way. Women don't really get as upset. I mean, I've never had a, a man break down and cry in a class, but I've had women do it all the time. Mm -hmm. So it allows them to release. They have, I, I find that women are a little bit open, more open to what am I missing? And they're okay with saying they don't know. Um, so it, it helps them, it helps them get to that next level. With that said, if I have a, a man who is in connection with his feminine side and I realize I'm not talking gender, right? But if he's in touch with his, his intuition, which is his feminine side, his connection to his higher self, he can do exactly what, what women will do. He'll, he'll have what it takes to get to that level of, of trust with his, his divine guidance, his own divine guidance. So, so where 
So where do you tap into, I know that, you know, in, in terms of channeling uh, cycles of growth and authenticity, what are your favorite ways to do so when you express yourself through art or are guiding others in, in understanding your art and even with teaching others how to harness art to their advantage? I need you to ask that a different way. I'm not a hundred percent sure. So I know that the emotions and embracing authenticity is something that you feel so strongly about that. This yeah. is you're, you've spoken so clearly about that. And, and how do you help channel them into cycles of growth? How do you help? How do you make that connection to show others? And it's a loaded question. How do you make that connection to show others? But then how do you transform that? into your works of art? Well, I'll answer this in a more vague way. Everything we do is a cumulative receiving of either wisdom, um, especially if we move through something that's hard. Um, otherwise it's just philosophy, right? We can read a book and go, yep, I know that, but you don't because you didn't live it. So what I try to help people understand is when they're moving through the even the processes, because I also teach and, and I, I, I have a background in healing and hands on all that stuff too, right? But what I really want people to understand is the level of consciousness that's achievable when we're in the creative mode is exactly how we're designed. We are actually designed to keep creating. We've been programmed to be afraid of that. And so what I try to help people understand is that creative process, number one, it lives in the present moment. There is no past. There is no future. I mean, and that's, that's something we could do a whole different show about. Right. True. But um, if I can get them out of the, like the, yeah, buts, right. Yeah. But uh, what if I, what if I do this or what if I, I don't really care. And I won't talk to, for example, I'm a mad colorist, but I can never, almost never tell you, what particular, is it Prussian blue? Is it, you know, cadmium red? Is it whatever, azo yellow? I don't, I don't care. I don't care what it's called. As soon as I name it, it's not what it is, which is just a vibrational, like, oh, okay, here's what we have. I love this color. Why? Because you resonate with it. So there's always a different conversation that's happening besides even though I know how to do a particular thing on canvas, you don't have to know any of that to be an artist. We're all artists of one kind or another. You're an artist in one field. I'm just an artist in a different field. That's all it is. It's the only difference. And I that, love, love that. Right? If, we're, if we're not creating, we're consuming. <laughs> true. That's very true. You talked about being a master healer. Can you, can you talk more about that piece and the, the integration of that with art. Yeah. I, if I used that terminology, I want to apologize. I do not consider myself a master healer. I do consider myself a master artist. And, and admittedly that may have come out of my mouth. So I'm going to like retract that. I am um, an ever open, ever spongy, bring me more information healer. I love doing that work. I am, however, a master artist. I have put in the time, I have put in the hours, I have put in the, you know, this is next level what I'm doing now. I already know how to make cool things. <laughs> there, there's no, there, and I can't help it. So when I talk about being a healer though, art is healing. And so when we combine those two things and we infuse them together, we have an integrative process that people can understand and love. I do the thing for a living that many, many people want to do when they're retired. So it's already an invitation that they're happy to say yes to, you know, does that make sense? It does. It's, it's pretty powerful how you, how you describe it. And, you know, when, when you talk about integrating the two, you know, I can't help but wonder, you know, what, what are some of those, what are some things that, or areas in life where you feel we could do better at embracing art, especially since these last couple of years where it's been a struggle for all of us, just the transition from 2020. What, where can we do more uh, when it comes to art and tapping into 
that into artistry. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think it's almost happening organically, which is an interesting thing. There's a project I'm working on right now that has an integrative process and an immersive process. And it's akin to some of the uh, Frida did is they're doing one on Frida. They did one on Van Gogh and they're where you go and you kind of walk into and AI and augmented realities is helping us do really cool things around this. Like a whale can like fly right across your face um, holographically, of course. <laughs> but um, I think, I think when we take something um I'll give you an example. Yesterday I was talking to my sister and my sister is not an artist and she has an appreciation for it, but of course not like I do. But when she went to the Van Gogh exhibit, she was completely and utterly blown away because she was standing in the paintings. And so when we take something and we make it something else, then sometimes we can tap into a level of awareness in someone that they would not have achieved being in a museum or being in a gallery where it's, it's, it's a little pompous, right? We kind of, we did a thing with that. We don't want you know, everybody there. We only want the people who get it there. And it's like, no, art is for everyone. I say that it's sacred, but not precious. That's how I talk about it. Wow. That, that I've never heard it that way before, the sacred, but not precious. I, uh, can you say, can you say more about that? Yeah. Um, I'll use a story again, an example. I was taking a class with a friend of mine who's a psychologist and, and, um, she also makes her own art, although she doesn't put it into the public eye. And I was the only artist in the retreat and I walk in with, you know, paint clothes on and everybody else is like in flowy dresses and all that. I'm like, what's going on? What is happening here? I thought this was an art retreat. She goes, Ooh, you're in trouble because there's nothing about this. She said, I'm going to have to undo everything you know as an artist to get you to understand what it is I do. And so she gave me this huge, all these, she gave me a big wall because it was me, right? And all these pieces of paper and inferior paint. It was like, uh, what was it? it was like poster paint. Oh my God. The first day I was just angry all day. I'm like, what am I doing here? What is happening? What's going on? I don't understand. I could be in the Bahamas. So <laughs> I'm doing all of this. And by the third day I got it, it clicked in. I don't have to make anything beautiful. In fact, she would prefer that I do not make anything beautiful and just paint the way I now show others how to paint with reckless abandon. And at the end of it, we had to do something to sort of like showcase what we did all week. And for me, that was when I coined the phrase precious, sacred, not precious. And I took my paintings and I put them. Now everybody knew that I was like an, the real deal artist. So I put my paintings all over the ground and that was my art show. And I wanted them to walk on the paintings and no one would do it. Oh, it was wow. crazy, except of course, for my friend, the, the teacher, she picked up a chair, she put it right in the middle. She sat down, crossed her legs and went, well, this is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of it, we had a big bonfire and I burned them all. Oh, okay. now what was the significance behind that? They're not precious. Mm. And let go. Do you see the monks that do the sand paintings and then they, they blow them away when they're finished. It is in the act of creation where, where it lives. Now, as an artist who makes a living making art, that's a really bold statement to say, I, I mean, I'm, I must have painted 30 paintings that week. I mean, just, oh, they went on and on and on and on. And when I did that, I thought to myself, now you're a real artist. Now you can actually create a painting and let it stay in the world and know that if something happens to the material aspect of that painting, although much to the chagrin of the owner, it's okay. Nothing is permanent. The sacredness is in the channeling, in the working through the piece. The end result, although beautiful and dare I say important, the preciousness can take a little bit of a back seat. And trust me, I say that I have to choke it out still when I say it, because right, I'm an artist who wants to sell art and it's important, it's conscious art and this is what I do. So I, it really taught me a lot about 
what's important. I could lose my health. I could lose my home. I could lose my friends. I could lose my dog. Am I still going to be okay? That's the point. What's the most surprising result from becoming an artist? What was the one thing that maybe happened that you didn't expect to happen? Same. <laughs> Notoriety. Um, I, I didn't know, I didn't know I was going to make it. Right. I thought I'm, I'm just going to do what I do. And I didn't like, even though I'm very driven, I didn't really, right. You don't think, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm actually going to do this thing. I'm going to make a living doing it. I'm going to be able to have nice things. The other thing was connection to others. I, I really didn't, that was, it was the journey of art making that helped me be able to say what I say to you now. Um, the journey of connection with others was, was a massive surprise. I, I didn't see that coming and I, I love it, but. That's incredible. That's incredible. We're going to take a commercial break. We will be right back after this. fragile and we're constantly reminded just how fragile life can be especially when we or a loved one is told we have cancer cancer survivor myself I can tell you we still feel very alone in this journey there's a study that's been shown that patients who are socially isolated have a worse prognosis have a worse outcome than patients who are socially interconnected. Buddies for Life is a non-profit cancer support group for those whose life has been impacted by cancer. Humor, hope, heart, and hugs. Humor, hope, heart, hugs, and a whole lot of love. Share this with your friends and family and support this community in every way you can. No one should face cancer alone. I am a chemo buddy for life. We are a buddies network. No one does cancer alone. Be a buddy. And we are all here for you as a community of love. We are chemo buddies for life. And if you've heard three words, you have cancer, for yourself or someone else, you belong with us at chemo buddies for life. Healing through connections. We're back here on the health revolution and we're excited that we are continuing to grow and, and excited to welcome more and more viewers. We want to take a moment right now to recognize a sponsor of the show. Take a look. My guest today is Jean Bissett. She is a renowned conscious artist and healer. Jean, we've been talking, of course, the journey, and you speak so eloquently about how the connection between us as humans and art, that that integration can really transcend our lives in so many different ways. What are some things that you envision for yourself as you continue to make an impact in, in the lives of others through your work? Oh my goodness. This is where I get to talk about all the exciting things happening. Yes. <laughs> uh, I am a co-founder of an immersive called Gaia Rising. It is um, 10 extremely large mural sized paintings that depict visions of, for example, Gaia herself, the return of the elders, um, it addresses issues like global warming. It addresses issues like child trafficking. Um, it is just flowing through me in a way that I didn't expect at all. And we are hoping to take it global. And 
perhaps even speak with a company who will do some projection and augmented reality immersion. It is an art and healing experience for people though. It's not just art. It's the first time it's ever been done um, in this way. And I'm so happy to be able to talk about it now because it's, you know, when you're holding on to something like it, you just can't talk about it yet. So that's exciting. That's going to happen next year. We are still working on, on all the paintings and, and all of the things that go into that and the websites and the tickets and, and whatever. Uh, but the other thing that's really exciting for me is I am writing a book about my journey about the how to how to alchemize to the, the to the level of freedom that's happening as well i am launching something very important to me that took me a while to learn which is called spirit of place commissioned paintings which are as a healer as a psychic as an intuitive i can walk into a space and feel the energy of the space and it's usually about the helpful energies of the space and your spirit of place is what you align with in the space. And I can then translate that to, to color and shape and form and, and as something aesthetically pleasing to the client, um, which is where I have to get my ego, my, my artist ego out of the way. So I don't really paint what I want to paint at that point either, right? I'm painting for the other and translating what comes through. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many things happening. I've, I've got shows coming up that I can't even mention yet because they don't have specific dates and locations yet, but, um, have you, so when you do shows, what, what can someone expect? Like just the, the typical, the, the setup and how, how you are, how you're actively part of a show and, and what you present, what, what goes into that? Well, hopefully a lot of fun. Okay, yes, of course. <laughs> Pretty lighthearted creature. Um, I I encourage people weirdly to touch the paintings. They're not, again, they're not precious. They're they're made of you know acrylics and cloth. They're made of plastic and cloth. So I I you know I I I do get yelled at for letting people touch the paintings because the people who love me are like you know fingerprints ah la, la, and I'm like eh, it's just all yeah, part your of your paintings. Do you get yelled at for people touching your paintings? No, I get yelled at from like the people who take my managers and they're like stop telling people to touch your paintings. Oh. <laughs> Someday we may have to just put up acrylic walls. I don't know, but um, I want them to feel their way through them. I want people to feel relaxed. Um, art can be, again, it can be a little pompous and, and pretentious. I hope that I bring a grounded element to that. I hope there's a lot of laughter. I hope there's a, some crying. I, I hope, right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm planning something now in Asheville. I think I'm going to do a farm to table dinner for a, like an ex exclusive group of folks that have really been a part of my world and supported me and things like that. So when I do a show, I'm looking to do something different. I'm looking to disrupt the norm. I want it not to be normal. You know, right. let's not walk around with our little stem, you know, let's have beer. Let's <laughs> like, you know. so I, I'd like to bring, I'd like to bring a groundedness to the art world, um, which again, makes me somewhat of a disruptor. It's, it's what I love doing is something a little bit different, like the female version of Banksy, I suppose. I don't know. Yes. So what would be your, your dream way of disrupting the norm? What would you, what is one of your dreams that you would love a breakthrough moment for what art can do for so many of us? Well, I'm actually doing it. Um, art and healing together aside from art therapy or, you know, like sort of like the almost conventional way of looking at that, right. where I literally, um, you know, channel or bring in codes. And then we put activated keys through the work of my partner, Rena Parikh, who is a, an amazing healer. Um, and we actually create something that's alive. You know, I come from the world of animism anyway, so I believe that everything is alive, but this takes it to the next level and helping people understand that and, and encoding particular frequencies into the art. It all, it's already a disruptive process. 
altogether. And if I do go back into the gallery system, I do it, but maybe not. Maybe just do four shows a year. Maybe I speak about it. Maybe I teach about it. Maybe, right? Multiple streams of whatever. So I, I think it makes me uniquely qualified to be unique. <laughs> so the, in who's your, let me, let me back up here. Who is, can you name for me some of your favorite uh, female artists that have, that have broken barriers and that have really transcended the, the, the growth and where art can take us all? Females. Yes. Uh, Helen Frankenthaler, um, specifically Hilma AF Klimt, which she was an occultist and she was way ahead of her time. And when she was discovered, which was more recently, I mean, she's been deceased for some time, but her work was so futuristic that nobody really understood it. And now everybody's like, Oh my God, what is happening here? I totally get it. So I, I would say I even have, I don't own posters, but I do have a print of, of one of her pieces to remind me to push myself beyond what's comfortable. Mm. And I would say, she is one of, one of my, yeah. Um, Georgia O'Keefe. Um, she's one of my sheroes. She was wearing pants and smoking cigars and riding on motorcycles, but not on the back of some guy. She was driving it herself. She was doing stuff. <laughs> right? She was like middle fingers flying high. I don't care. <laughs> So I, I love her rebelism and I want, I want to aspire to that. I want to aspire to not caring what people think. Um, I'm getting there, but you know, we do care. We do care. Very, so. very, very invigorating. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We will be right back after this. Hi there, I'm Dan Hafner. I'm the host of the show Tech Bites with Dan Hafner. Join me live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific on the Achieve TV network for the latest technology and business news and advice. Join me right here on E360 TV. We're back here on the health revolution. It's been quite an, an incredible conversation with my guest, Jean Bissett. She is a renowned conscious artist and healer. Jean, where can viewers find you as they're wanting to know more information about you? Oh, it's almost impossible not to find me. <laughs> Certainly my website, jeanbissett.com. I have a personal Facebook page, a public and business Facebook page. I have an Instagram channel. I have a YouTube channel. I'm being told I have to do TikTok now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can find me almost anywhere by my name. Just Google me and I'll, I'll show up. Come find me. Wow, absolutely. And this has been a fun conversation with you oh, today. You. I, I've been delighted to have you on the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for asking. I, this was so much fun. Bye. You're an amazing interviewer. I just wanted to say that publicly before we went offline that I have been interviewed by quite a few people in the last several months and you are the bomb diggity. I'm just no. going to say. Shuxi, Shuxi, thank you. I appreciate you made that. It easy. You made it easy. Thank you. And for all of our viewers who are tuning in, please don't forget at the bottom of your screen, there's a little tab that says show notes. You'll be able to tap that and get all of the information where you can find Jean and all of her social media handles, all the information. And then in addition to that, don't forget to hit the subscribe button at the bottom, no matter where you've tuned in from. And regarding our show, our website is thehealthrevolutiontv.com. We certainly would love for you to check us out. Any, any topics that are of interest to you that you would love to see us cover on here and get 
more uh, incredible voices to, to have that right connection and conversation. We welcome that. And because we're out of time, we want to remind you that the Health Revolution is on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you did tune in live on the broadcast, we appreciate you coming on in and, and of course, continue to to tap in and add your input and feedback. And until next time, we will see you soon. Take care.